Who here uses Waze? So Waze is an example outside of healthcare that we should study for how we can think about big data, how we can triangulate data to make sense of the world. So if you've used Waze, you've seen the graphical user interfaces and how we can report all sorts of things actively. We can actively report information or data, depending on how you think about it. But this is information about whether there are traffic jams, whether police are nearby, whether there's been an accident, so on. A variety of different types of information. Variety is one of the V's I'm going to talk about of big data. Volume of data, a variety of data, and velocity of data. There are a couple other V's that are described, a veracity of data and value of data. But we'll talk about those first three first. So there's a variety of different data. And the data comes in, and each individual driver is a sensor in a network and is moving and passively monitored and actively monitored. So there's both passive and active reporting. Information streaming in passively from the speed of the car, the direction of the car, uh, and so on. Triangulated around with other sensors in the area and also supplemented or augmented by information and context that's coming in from the users themselves. So this is a big data network. There's a huge volume of data and constantly growing. There's a variety of data sources that are streaming in at once at great velocity. Velocity, speed, constantly updating, constantly rethinking and relearning the topography, the information in this space, so that drivers have knowledge and can change, in this case, their behavior, where they're moving, how they're driving, and so on. What's wrong with this picture? The answer is those are cardboard cutouts. Those aren't people at all. This is an experiment done in Washington, D.C. area where uh, the police have just put up cardboard cutouts and um, it apparently slows people down when you see not one but two menacing cardboard cutouts, cops, hitting you with a radar gun. Now, of course, if you're in Waze, you hit, uh, there's, there are cops here. And there are no cops there. In fact, if you want people to stay away from your neighborhood, getting to the earlier point, you put these up and you create false information. So uh, there's false information around us, and we have to sometimes figure out what's real and what isn't. This is not real. Those are not real policemen. Those are cardboard cutouts. So there's a few lessons from ways that I want to start with as we start to explore the world of big data, because it's one. This is a, uh, this is a system we're almost all familiar with now. If you're not using it, you've heard about it. First, we need to use data to inform our decisions. In this case, we're deciding how we're going to drive home. It's a pretty pressing decision. It's not necessarily that important in the grand scheme of things. It's not like deciding how to treat cancer. That's a very important decision. It's not like deciding whether somebody sitting in front of us is uh, being abused. That's a really important question, one that we'll come back to later. But it's a still pressing question, how am I going to drive home today? We can figure that out by sharing data and by creating systems where we promote the sharing of data. We display the data effectively, visualize the data in a way that engages the user. Data visualization is absolutely critical. It's a critical component of big data analytics is to present the data as a story. And there's a whole science behind data visualization. We had a separate talk on that earlier in the year. Continuously verify the data. That's one of the V's, the now five V's of big data is the veracity or the validity of the data. Somebody who drives back past that cardboard cutout could put a note into ways that says those are not real cops. So we have a network that is updating itself and constantly learning. Creating robust models that work without perfect data. We don't have perfect data. The cardboard cutouts is an example. But we can work around that if we're able to create models that work around imperfect data. And ultimately, relying on people in the end. Not machines, but people. Right? We are people. We are healthcare providers taking care of other people. We are augmented, hopefully, by the zeros and ones that provide us information. 
but ultimately we need to rely on each other and our own judgments to make final decisions about how we manage very complex matters. So I want to now move from that to a completely different part of the world, a different um, area of uh, inquiry, and talk about the story of John Schick and what it teaches us about the three V's of big data and how we can even learn a little bit from Waze as we understand the story of John Schick. And after we tell this story, we'll move into some other examples that get closer to healthcare. But this is, in fact, a healthcare story. And it started in 2012, in February, when I received this letter in the mail. And at the time, I was at UCLA and happened to be the fellowship training program director and got a letter. And on the back of the letter was a signature, this big kind of looping signature. The letter itself was wrapped in thick transparent tape and was very bulky, unusual. It kind of gave me pause. In fact, I hesitated for a second before I opened it. I even kind of, I literally shook it because I was remembering the 9-11 letters, remember the anthrax letters, and it just had that appearance to it, this big blocky writing on the outside. It gave me a, a pause that there, was a, that there was a problem. This was a data point, a piece of information maybe. Didn't know what to do about it, didn't have any knowledge about whether this was a threat or just a piece of mail that came to me. But something about it gave me a gut feeling that there was something weird. Well, anyway, I opened up this letter, and you can't read it yet, but this is what was inside. And I happened to have blacked out some of the names, because what happens next is quite extraordinary. But there were some pieces of information in this letter that were also strange. And as I began to read this letter, it was clear that this was written by somebody who was schizophrenic. It was a patient at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center that had reached out to me asking me for help because his pancreatitis was not being properly treated and he needed help. He explained that uh, he has been diagnosed with incipient pancreatitis and he had something called the oxyhemoglobin deoxygenation curve test, which I think I remember from physiology, but it's not an actual test that we, that we use routinely that was most directly refused by a social worker who brandished a gun-toting UPMC ruffian while I was waiting with a phlebotomist for my blood to be drawn. And then he wonders, was that gun ready? And was that gun loaded? And uh, that, too, was unusual. He then went on to explain to me that the Digestive Disorders Clinic as a whole uh, doctors, ruffians, and secretaries, they're incoherent and should not be treating patients. Uh, the doctor's schedule is blocked, but you and some other doctor's work may save my life. UPMC will not, and I require money to travel. Will you help me? So that was what I received in the mail. And my first reaction is this is preposterous, and it's actually kind of humorous. At one point, he talked about having a stroke in his talus bones, which is Last I remember in the ankle somewhere. Okay. You don't get a stroke in your talus bone. So he was paranoid, he was delusional, and he may have been hallucinating, and he had delusions of grandeur as well. He explained that he was an important biological researcher at Harvard. Turns out he was at Harvard and did work in a laboratory. He also said that he worked at Vanderbilt, which was also true, it turned out. I didn't know what to do about that, but I decided I needed to do something. And I wrote this email. And uh, in the email, I wrote to the doctor that was listed, who happened to be a gastroenterologist like me at UPMC. And I said, I don't really want to be alarming here. But I did receive this very strange email from this man, Mr. Schick. And he asked for input regarding care for his chronic pancreatitis. And he mentioned you as a treating physician and that he's being blacklisted. And he has bizarre ailments. It looks like he's schizophrenic. It was a little bit disturbing. He did mention your name, and he referred to being held up at gunpoint. I thought you should be aware that he's contacting different doctors around the country um, asking for help and telling the story. So I sent out a piece of information to somebody else who responded to me within 12 hours. 
and said, thank you. Uh, yes, I had done an upper endoscopy on this patient, uh, and he was indeed unusual. I did note him hovering around my apartment entrance as I was headed with my child to drop her to daycare and had been a little alarmed. It turned out he lived in the same building, so I wasn't too worried about that. But I'm going to forward your email to my division administrator. I'm not sure what else to do at this point, but this is alarming. I spoke to him after all of this, and he explained to me that what happened is he walked out of his apartment door with his two-year-old daughter in his arms. And he looked up, and there was a man standing there, a menacing man, who stared at him, and then looked back down at his daughter and looked back up at him. And he said it was as if there was a glass wall between us that all of a sudden shattered and broke through his consciousness and he took a step back and then he turned around and he walked away. And he said that he believes that his daughter saved his life and that he wanted to kill him. That's the feeling that he got when he walked out of his apartment door. Well, suffice it to say this was alarming to me and I wrote back. And I said, I think it's wise to contact risk management and investigate this swiftly. I live 2,000 miles away, but I am disturbed to read this. You need to act on this expeditiously. And I request that Mr. Schick not be aware that I sent these communications for fear of some kind of retaliation. And I wrote that I wrote. I didn't do this by any stretch to be some kind of hero. That's, this was a prerequisite for a good night's sleep. Well, we didn't hear anything for about 12 days until uh, Garth Fuller, who happens to be maybe in this audience and works with us, came uh, running into my office and said, have you watched what's happening on the news? Have you turned on CNN today? And I said, no. What's going on? Well, somebody has walked into UPMC Medical Center. And this is a picture of that somebody who's walking in with a trench coat. And underneath that trench coat are two semi-automatic weapons. And in about two seconds, he's going to walk through that door, and he's going to turn to his left, and he's going to open fire and shoot the security guard that's right next to him. Then he's going to turn to his right, and he's going to shoot a woman right through the aorta who's sitting behind the information desk. She's going to be saved in emergency surgery about two hours later when she's rushed up. But then he's going to turn to his left, and he's going to run down a hallway and start playing cat and mouse shooting match with doctors who are bouncing around between poles trying to stay clear of this patient. He's going to hit one doctor. He's then going to turn around, and he's going to see a 26-year-old graduate psychiatry student, psychology student, walking in with a bag of McDonald's from lunch, and he's going to shoot him right through the aorta. That guy is going to run down the, the, uh, the hallway, bleeding out of his chest, and is going to die on the ground. And then this guy is going to pick him up and use him as a human shield as the police storm in and have a shootout with him. He's going to hit one police officer, and finally he himself is killed in this melee and it's over. And that's a true story. And that's what happened. Now this is a talk about big data, so it may not be clear this moment how this has anything to do with that. But I want to try and unpack what happened here and talk a little bit about how it actually is an example of how we could use big data approaches to go back and think about what happened here and what possibly could have been done differently. Because this guy is, in fact, John Schick, right? That's the guy that emailed me. This is John Schick. He grew up in Long Beach, not far from here. This is his high school senior yearbook photo. And there's sort of like two times in life in a photograph when you should really be smiling. It's your high school yearbook photo and your, maybe your wedding photo. And he's not smiling. In fact, if you look at most of, there's, there's some interesting examples of this, most recent mass killers if you look at their photographs, they're generally not smiling at all, or they have a wry, sardonic smile that is completely unnatural. And you start to sort of think, are there outward signs that we need to look at? Well, this gets into some really complicated territory, and I'm not a mental health expert. We have mental health experts in here. But it's just interesting. He was a um, very, very smart student and excelled in mathematics and chemistry. He went to Carleton College in Minnesota, which is a great liberal arts school, where he majored in chemistry, I believe. But before long, it was clear that he was rubbing other students the wrong way, sometimes literally. But certainly figuratively, he was not well received. 
and he was counseled by his, um, by his professors, and they tried to work with him. He eventually moved to Columbia University and transferred out. Smart guy. Where again, he was uh, majoring in this, here he was majoring in computer science. He was found there to have uh, flooded his apartment. And people downstairs found water pouring through their ceiling. And he wouldn't answer the door. The cops finally came. And um, he greeted the cops with a knife. And they had to taser him and put him in four point restraints and uh, put him on hold. Of course, he eventually was taken out of hold. He then transferred across the country again to Portland State University, where the exact same thing happened. He got into arguments, he got into fights, and um, he was kicked out. On his way out of there, at the Portland airport, he was um, a belligerent and threatening President Obama, and the Secret Service got involved. And here is the Portland Airport Police tasering him for a second time um, and uh, causing mayhem. After all that, he enrolled as a graduate student at Duskane University in Pittsburgh. Evidently, the people in Duskane did not get the memo from the people in Portland State or Columbia or the Secret Service or all these other people that knew about him and what was happening in his life. And again, the same thing happened. Here, he was made a, a TA in a chemistry laboratory. He would walk around the campus singing Harry Potter songs, wearing unusual clothes, and uh, threatening women, and was kicked out of the school completely. At this point, he was no longer accepted in the schools, but his formidable mind needed to occupy itself with something. So he occupied his time with his body. And he spent time at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and in particular, the Western Psychiatric Clinic, which is this building, seeking care for all sorts of ailments, from presumed lymphoma to, uh, to parasitic infections and everything in between. And he amassed a treasure trove in his, in, his, uh, in his house or his apartment of over 60 different types of medications in a, some, a, a bag that itself was, was something like 20 pounds heavy. They found that, along with crossbows and mathematical equations scrawled on the walls of his uh, apartment, uh, apartment walls uh, after all this happened. Uh, in his apartment, he would scream, and no one would know why. And while he was screaming, he would put this note out on the door. And this was photographed by his neighbor that said afterwards, when I heard about that shooting, I figured that was the guy that did it. That it had to be him. So my point here is this guy, John Schick, was a threat. And it turned out it was a real threat. And we're all faced by different kinds of threats in life. This is a mortal, horrible threat, one that we should hopefully never, ever have to experience. And one that we're talking about here at Cedar is how do we approach something like this to avoid this person from ever entering our hospital. That's another discussion. But he was a threat. He's emblematic of other kinds of threat. You know, cancer is a threat. Um, contraband on uh, a bag entering an airplane is a threat. There's all sorts of threats, real or imagined, that we think about in everyday life. This was a threat. And he was surrounded by a network of all sorts of people that knew he was a threat, including his parents, who lived on a boat. And there's a whole long discussion about how they did not intercede at all. Well, in any event, if you look at this network, it's not a network at all. It bears no resemblance to a network. It's a set of one-way lines that coordinate onto a threat, but there's very little cross-communication. There are only, in, after going through this, and this is from an article in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, this particular image, there is only uh, two communications, really. One was three. One was from me to the UPMC gastroenterology department which activated another connection to the Office of Risk Management. The only other connection was the primary care uh, clinics where, where John Schick was banging his bat against the door and the tables, uh, did contact the Department of Mental Health to see if he could be committed, but there wasn't enough information to do that. There's a lot more to this story that I'm not going to talk about right now, but the point was there are almost no intercommunications. When a network like Waze, which is, of course, a totally pedestrian, ridiculous example, compared to this one, 
but bears some res resemblance because this is what a normal network looks like, where there's intercommunication. And that's where the data and the inform then the information and knowledge comes. It's only after there's cross connections does information turn into knowledge. And ultimately, over time, knowledge turns into wisdom. In this case, with the parents working in tandem and coordinating his care, that did not happen. Nothing like this happened. Now, this is a topic unto itself. We could talk for hours about why this is difficult to manage. But I want to just talk about what does it mean to have a network, and what do networks look like? You've probably heard of this adage of the blind men and the elephant, right? Because that's what this situation was. The, the story of the blind men and the elephant is there's one blind man that feels something thick like, like a trunk of a tree. Uh, somebody else feels parchment. Somebody else feels a rope. But they're all encircling the same beast. They just don't realize it. They don't know that they're all encircling, in this case, an elephant. And we find ourselves, even in our own environment, encircling threats but we don't even realize it, even though collectively we do. In healthcare, I'll give an example, and certainly outside of healthcare, and this is a striking one. So those are the three Vs, is the volume of data. Lots of information from lots of people is necessary sometimes to triangulate on threats. A variety of different people in different states and times and places distributed and a velocity, so there's rapid updating, immediate updating of information. That's sort of the model. And those are the steps of big data analytics in general, which is to collect the zeros and ones, to report the zeros and ones, then to have an, a, a hub that analyzes those zeros and ones and turns those zeros and ones into information and then into knowledge so that we can act on them in a way that's timely and effective. Those are the four steps of big data analytics. And if you think to this, this, this Schick example, you can imagine how that might have been possible. Because Schick was surrounded by all sorts of sensors. Very sensitive, not necessarily specific, but very sensitive people that were picking up on a concerning, concerning behavior. And if all those folks had an opportunity to report in and get out some kind of an analytic score that could actually be distributed across Threat quartiles, which is eerily close to what the NSA does. In fact, it is what they do, and that, that is the model, is then you have a threat pyramid where you can evaluate what level of threat this is and have an inverse pyramid, which is a response pyramid, so that we, we pick the right response for the right situation. Okay. Now, again, this is far away from healthcare at the moment, but you can think a little bit about how we approach this, our problems in the same way. Again, I'll give you some examples. This may sound completely ridiculous that we can do such a thing to stop a mass killer or a criminal, but it's not ridiculous at all. It happens, in fact, more and more because we are all interconnected, and social media in particular is an example of a big data network that connects us very closely. And here's an example from just a year or so ago, and I've shown this in some other talks, where there is a person over an on an overpass on Wilshire Boulevard near downtown with a rifle trained on people walking down Wilshire Boulevard. And he has taken the time to tweet about it and said, if I get 100 people to retweet this, I'm going to shoot the next person that walks by. That is the data point. Somebody in that network sees that and says, that doesn't look right. I have to report that and reports that to the police. The police then analyze that situation and immediately find out who this person is, because they have his Twitter account, and know where he lives, and track him down quickly, because that's the velocity part of big data, and they arrest him and take his weapon away from him. And that's a real story from right here in Los Angeles. And there are more examples like that. Almost every week, you'll start to see examples where criminals are being caught through big data analytics through social media. So this is just, again, way off base, not far, far away from healthcare, but I think it's helpful just to learn a little bit about how the three Vs can work. The volume of data that comes in, the variety of different data points, and the velocity of the data. And then we need to confirm the veracity of the data and then hopefully create value out of that. Let me move to another part and tell you the story of Ryan Kingsbury 
and this will start to lead us a little closer to examples in healthcare. And uh, what it teaches us about the limitations of big data as well, because we have to understand that. And ultimately, it comes back to us as humans integrating within the zeros and ones of big data. So this is a picture of a guy named Ryan Kingsbury. This is a picture of him in the New York Times. And he is a young aeronautical engineer, I believe, out of Boston. And uh, he is interested in weather patterns, and he's interested in airplanes, and he's interested in big data. And where the three come together, he identified a lucrative business opportunity. And this is the New York Times uh, profiling his very interesting story. You can see on the desk in front of him, he has some tickets. And uh, what is that all about? Well, anybody who has flown uh, knows, especially when things aren't going well, that, um, that airlines can overbook. You've probably heard this overhead announcement. This is the script, right? I'm gonna give up your seat on this flight. We're gonna offer you a ticket on the first flight out tomorrow. It's gonna cover your hotel, provide a travel voucher, so on. Uh, please see a gate agent now for further information. That's the script. You've heard that before, right? Has anybody been bumped from a flight? You guys have been? A bummer. You got paid. You guys both got paid. You're out, no problem, right? Well, that's what Ryan King's, that's the way he looks at it. Because when this announcement is made, he's already there waiting, because he knows they're gonna make this announcement. In fact, he books specifically on flights where there is a high probability that, they are going, that their algorithms are gonna misfire. He can predict when the algorithms are gonna misfire, and the overbooking algorithms are gonna lead to this kind of situation. And here's a picture of him in a little book about his story. Here he is with his father, it says at the bottom, the grueling wait on the 747 upper deck while boarding commences on the Lufthansa 423 from Boston to Frankfurt because he got thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in free tickets just through this ploy of predicting when the big data algorithms were going to fail. Now, I guess he doesn't have kids or anything because I, I can't really play that game, but, but he, he was able to. So how does he do that? Uh, well. And, and why do airlines overbook anyway? Well, this is an interesting quote from, uh, from the uh, VP for Pricing and Revenue. Airline seats are a perishable commodity. It's like a fruit that spoils. The moment the airplane door is closed, that item has perished, gone, right? So that makes sense. Just like uh, rooms in this hospital, if they are not full with a patient, it's a perished commodity. It's just sitting there, not making money, uh, not generating revenue just like your clinic visit or our endoscopy unit. If we don't have patients moving through it, we have a lot of nurses and technicians standing around, that also is a perish commodity. So there is something to be said for using data to uh, maximize the throughput in a uh, resource intensive environment like an ICU or a emergency room unit or uh, for that matter an airplane. So it's a sound business practice for airlines to overbook. They wanna minimize flights and literally maximize seats and seats. So the game for them is as few planes as possible are gonna go out and everyone's gonna be completely full. That makes sense, right? So they have to predict. It requires prediction. They have to figure out how many people are gonna show up for that airplane and uh, who's not gonna show up and overbook accordingly. So how do they do that? Well, they look at lots of things. They know there are certain times of year, if you're in Denver, that, uh, that storm systems are gonna move through. Uh, it's getting a little bit harder to predict with changes in the weather. Uh, if it's a 4th of July weekend, they pretty much know that people are gonna show up. Uh, if it's a midweek um, trip, there may be a lot of business travelers that are not gonna come back because they're in their meetings and have decided to, to put off the flight. They have millions and millions of flight segments with terabytes of data on who shows up to flights and who doesn't. And then they have algorithms and regression models that they run to try and predict flight by flight who's gonna show up and who's not going to show up for that flight. So the whole point is that they want the plane to be 100% full, and if they predict, if their algorithm predicts that that flight segment is going to be 90% full, then naturally they're gonna overbook by 10%. And uh, if people ha end up showing up at a greater rate, then there's the deal, and you guys make a little bit of money, and Ryan Kingsbury makes some money, or some people are really inconvenienced. So how have they been doing with these regression models? Well, this is uh, data up to at least 2009, 
And it turns out, not so great. Uh, involuntary bumping still occurs at pretty much the same rate. Uh, and that would suggest that the algorithms need to keep learning because they're not really getting that much better at predicting who's going to show up and who's not going to show up for flights. So this brings up another discussion point that is crucial to the world of big data. And it's the limitations of zeros and ones and the limitations of models in general, especially prediction models, because most big data approaches are, not most, but many are trying to predict what's going to happen next predict that John Schick is going to do something horrible, or predict what the traffic is going to do and what the fastest way home is, and so on. So predicting the future using data from the past is always a problem. And uh, this is the concept, is we predict with something like this, a regression equation, where we're predicting something like no-show rate for a, uh, for, uh, for a flight. And we're using explanatory variables, like the weather or the day of the week, and each one of those variables is weighted by a coefficient of some sort, beta 1, beta 2, because some of those variables are more important than others. That all sounds good, and we talk about this in journal clubs, and we review an article about whether we can predict somebody's going to get cancer or somebody's going to survive or not after certain therapies. This is sort of the nuts and bolts of a journal club. But sometimes we forget that that regression equation does not apply necessarily to the patient in front of you, it applies to, in general, all patients. What about the patient in front of you? Because one thing we often don't talk about is that E at the end of the regression, regression equation, the error term. Right? That, that just is sort of brushed aside. We know there's a little plus or minus. But in general, we can predict. But I, we're not necessarily interested in general. We're interested in that person or that man who's threatening or this patient. I don't care in general. I care about this person. What do we make of that error term? We don't make a lot of it. We don't talk a lot about it. But big data can try to minimize that error term. That's one of the big approaches or big advantages of this, this way of thinking. We know about the error term from Sir Francis Galton, uh, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin and a really interesting historical figure. But he described the term regression to the mean. Maybe you've heard that term before, regression to the mean. And uh, he described it uh, in 1895. He presented data to the uh, Royal Academy of Science in London. I don't think they had PowerPoint presentations back then, but this, these are the literal, this is the data that he showed on the screen or on whatever, bulletin board or canvas or parchment. And he said, listen, I have plotted the height of father-son dyads. And here is something that if anything in biology is lockstep, it's got to be this. Like this. These are very closely correlated. And sure enough, look what happens when I plot the line between the father's height and the son's height. I can really predict what the son's height is going to be knowing the father's height. And uh, that's a regression equation. But the thing about that regression equation is where are the data behind it? The data behind it uh, are not shown here. The data behind it are shown here which is a cloud, an amorphous blob of data. And we often forget that we draw lines through data, and we focus on the line. But we don't focus on the cloud of data behind that line. So if I knew that a father's height is 72 inches, the son's height could be anywhere between 58 and 78 inches. On average, it's going to be about 70 whatever, two or three inches tall. Uh, does that help me predict any one individual's son's height? It gets us a little bit closer. The regression of the mean part is even more complex. It's pointing out that the really tall fathers don't have really tall sons. And the really short fathers don't really have really short sons. It tar starts to tail off. That's called regression of the mean. So we start seeing these lines getting kind of squiggly to trace through the data. The data is crazy complicated. And this is something as biologically locked up as father and son heights, or for that matter, mother-daughter heights. What about things like cancer risk, or the, these complex things that we deal with in every day? How precise can we really be in predicting any one person's likelihood of having a disease or responding to a therapy if we can't, this is the best we can do for predicting uh, father-son height dyads? So this has been a point of a, a lot of discussion. 
Uh, Nassim Taleb has spent a lot of time writing about this in the Black Swan, for anyone who's interested. Nate Silver, who many of you may know, The Signal and the Noise, has spent time thinking about these problems. The future doesn't always resemble the past. Uh, it sometimes does, but natural data are super, super messy, and we just have to get used to it. Can we get some control over these data? Can we try to squeeze a little bit more predictive value out of it? Because our predictors themselves are often imprecise, especially the predictors that we work with. We think we have a handle on the data, but our data are squirrely. Just think about the symptoms people report to us. As a gastroenterologist, somebody says to me, I have bloating. What does bloating mean anyway? Right? Let's talk about that for, for half an hour. Because even the things we think we understand about our patients are often not even close to the way they perceive it to be. So we're not talking about a chessboard. We're not talking about IBM Watson beating our chess champions. Because a chessboard is perfectly known. There's very little perfectly known in the world that we live in. Very hard to predict. But we have a false sense of our ability to predict. And that's been established over and over again. So how do we do better? And this is what I want to end with in terms of kind of the big data approaches. One is we can try and find better predictors, uh, predictors that we're not currently using. We can try and build self-learning prediction models that will learn from their mistakes, kind of like Waze does when somebody passes a cardboard cutout, and update our models. We can select the most granular unit of analysis. I want to explain what that means, because that's a big principle for big data analytics, the most granular unit of analysis. So go back to the airplane. Remember with that quote, the quote was not, the, per the perishable commodity is not the whole plane. The plane is going to take off. It is gone. Okay? The perishable commodity was more granular than the plane. The perishable commodity was the seat. The perishable commodity was more granular. But the way airlines traditionally overbook planes is they don't look at seat by seat who's getting on that plane. They look at the plane. And that's the unit of analysis. And they know, in general, how many people show up for a plane flight. But it would be a lot better if we knew who was signed up for that plane. Specifically, who is in seat 17C? Who is that person? And what do we know about that person? Does that person miss flights? Right? What kind is, a patient, is that person a, a frequent flyer? Uh, is that person traveling for business or for pleasure? Because we can create a regression model on that person and figure out if that person's going to show up. And if we do that, we might be better able to predict the plane, uh, well, how full it's going to be. So these principles have been described in many different books. I happen to like this one a lot. It's called Big Data. And it goes through the three Vs in detail. And in this book, they describe examples where organizations use that most granular level of data possible. And the other principle that they describe in the book is that n equals all. That's a really important concept. n equals all. We're used to n equals whatever. n equals all means we're going to use every single bit of data that we can get our hands on. We are not going to limit this in any way. We're going to get it all. We're going to get every single bit of data. Now, n equals all doesn't necessarily mean terabytes of data. So for example, anybody read that book, Freakonomics? Anybody read that book? Yeah. So in Freakonomics, um, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Levitt. Right, Levitt. Describes how he showed that there's cheating in sumo wrestling. Remember that? There's a whole chapter on sumo wrestling. And he statistically demonstrated that sumo wrestling is um, fixed. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. It turns out it, it's fixed. At least it was when he looked. How do you figure that out? He looked at every single sumo wrestling match that had ever been recorded, every one. And he looked at them all, where there's data, and he ran regression models, and he figured this out. N equals all. It wasn't terabytes of data, or exabytes, or petabytes, or yottabytes. It was relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but it was all. N equals all. That's how he did it. You know about Amazon, because if you use it, you'll get these really eerie messages that say, hey, you want, you want to read these books? And you're like, yeah. It's a good book. Wow. And you open it up, you're like, I do want to read that book. How do they know that you want to read that book? Because they know what you bought. And they know what other people have bought who bought that book. And they know what people like you like. And they have triangulated through this massive database, precisely looking at the person level, 
what you are, and they have a complete and total profile on you. And they know what you like. And sure enough, at least for me, um, it, hits, it, hits hard, it hits home pretty well, except when my wife is buying children's books on my account. So I get some funny stuff that comes through, too. Um, but uh, some of you may have heard this story about Target. Target looks and profiles every one of its customers. And Target um, is able to figure out which of its customers is pregnant. You may have heard this story. Charles Duhigg at the uh, New York Times wrote about this, and he wrote about it in his book, The Power of Habit. And he described one case in particular where this father was furious that his 15-year-old daughter got an advertisement in the mail for maternity clothes and cribs and all sorts of postnatal stuff. And he wrote Target and said, you know, this is really uh, unacceptable. It's not right. You shouldn't be sending my daughter this stuff. And they said, oh, we're so sorry. We shouldn't have done that. You're right. Well, he wrote back and he said, it turns out there have been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. Uh, she's due in August and I owe you an, an apology. And what they do is they look at each individual person, each customer, and they say, you know what? A customer that buys multivitamin tablets and then a few weeks later starts to buy moisturizing cream, and then a few weeks later, uh, or a, few, a month or two later, starts buying throw towels, and then buys a blue throw rug, is going to have a boy on this date. And it turns out they're pretty good at that. So if they can do it, you know, can we do that? Can we be more granular uh, with the data that we have? Let me finally get to healthcare. Some of you may have seen this example, but I want to explain it again if you've seen it. This is a figure that looks something like a northern blot or a gel or something I don't, I, don't, I don't work with. It's not that. This is a patient. And what is happening here is a computer is profiling this patient and is evaluating where this patient has moved throughout a, health, a, a closed healthcare system. And it turns out um, up here is, this is the time axis on the y-axis. And these are months that are counting down to that blue line. And at that blue line, a diagnosis is made. And along the way, there are, yeah, there are stripes. And each stripe is a, a type of clinic visit. This particular patient, who happens to be a woman, is reporting a variety of injuries, is reporting an increasing number of gastroenterology visits, really in the last 10 months in particular, is seeing us in GI a lot, some skeletal-related uh, and some circulatory, and so on. At this point right here, the computer has made a diagnosis. But the blue line is when humans made the diagnosis finally. Okay. What is the diagnosis? Right. The diagnosis is domestic violence. So the computer has used big data approaches and is using a variety of different data, a volume, a large volume of data, okay, and doing it with a great deal of velocity, you know, years before us, and is identifying a patient at risk for domestic violence. And it turns out this algorithm is highly accurate, something like 85% accurate. So this was out of Harvard, British Medical Journal, and it's a striking thing because in a gastroenterology clinic, I may see a distressed uh, woman or man who is ex experiencing abdominal pain and I'm going to focus all on that abdominal pain. Uh, in a GU clinic, there may be pelvic pain. Or there, in a neurology clinic, there may be a paresthesias, right? Or in the emergency room, there may be a broken jaw. But no one of us is talking to, we're not talking to each other. We're not saying, hey, wait a second. Did you know that that patient in the emergency room, did you know that patient saw me for IBS last week? And that IBS, um, early adverse life events and physical and uh, sexual abuse are a risk factor. Did you know that? We don't have those conversations. We don't have the ability to. The computer can do it for us. We should have those conversations, but it's hard. That is what a network looks like. And this is an example of big data making an impact in healthcare. This is another example uh, that some of you have certainly seen before of how uh, Google does this. Google is looking at all times at the you know, masses of data flowing into its servers, the variety of different data points, and they're coming in with great velocity. And those three Vs, variety, velocity, and volume, are being integrated, in this case, to identify when there are flu outbreaks and where those flu outbreaks are. And this is the original validation paper of the Google flu tracker uh, that I think was in science. 
And what you're looking at here is the CDC data with that gold line and superimpose the Google flu trend estimator in the blue line. And you can see that they almost perfectly overlap, that Google's able to identify when flu is happening. The interesting thing about this is that Google does it two weeks before the CDC. Google identifies the flu outbreak almost immediately when maybe something could be done about it from a public health standpoint. But um, it takes the CDC two weeks later of receiving information and figuring it out. So this has been hailed as sort of the best example ever of big data, except that the Google flu tracker has been failing lately because they keep trying to perfect it and they're having trouble actually predicting year-to-year -year variation. So that's a warning sign too. The NIH has caught on to this and they've realized that in healthcare we have to learn from the Amazons and targets of the world and the Googles of the world and figure out how we're gonna start doing this in our own environments. And uh, they now have something called the BD2K, which is the Big Data to Knowledge, Data to Knowledge. This is a trans-NIH initiative. Every institute now has budget set aside for big data projects. And for those of you that are interested in this, there's lots of opportunities for training and for, for grants in the, in the world of big data. I wanna end with this point, and I think I've got five minutes and I'll finish it up, which is what do airline executives and colonoscopists have in common? give you a worked example of how we've actually done this in real life. So we've talked about uh, the problem that airline executives face. What do they have in common with colonoscopists? Any guesses? Finite number of spots. Finite number of spots. And a related problem is no-shows. People don't like showing up for their colonoscopy. They don't show. They don't show up. So we had this problem of no-shows. And here's a very practical example. No-shows are rampant throughout healthcare. You probably have no-shows in your clinic or your office or your practice. And it's particularly a problem for us in GI because people don't wake up and say, I cannot wait to get scoped today. This is spectacular. So they don't show up, and that's a problem. There's, missed, it's, there's a perishable commodity. We have an endoscopy unit that is empty. And worse than that, we have other patients that need their colonoscopy that are not getting their colonoscopy because they're waiting for the other people that did not get their colonoscopy. So this also reduces clinic revenues. So how do we fix this problem? Well, the traditional approach is remind people, call them, mail them, text them, hire a lot of people to wrap them up and uh, bring them in. And uh, it turns out that's been looked at. And those things do help a little bit, but not a lot. Not a whole lot, it turns out. Not enough to start really changing revenue where this is a big problem. You can do other things like fine people if they don't show up. I missed a, a physical therapist appointment and the guy charged me like 150 bucks or something. Oh my God. I'll get myself therapy. So how can we uh, deal with this? Well, we can overbook by a fixed percentage like the airlines do. So you know what? We know that on Tuesdays, 20% of people don't show up. So we're going to overbook by 20%. We could do that. But I don't think, you know, it's one thing to be bumped from a flight. It's another to be bumped from a colonoscopy when you have prepared all night, evacuated your bowels, and you're naked on a table. <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen. Turns out we overshot. We don't have the staff. Not acceptable. Okay? Uh, that will make people upset. The other problem is when we look at our own endoscopy uh, utilization, it looks a little bit like this. It's really unpredictable. It bounces and moves just like show rates for aerpl airplanes bounce and move. So in this case, on these days, everyone showed up, and over here, uh, almost nobody showed up. So we can't have a fixed percentage of overbooking or else we're gonna get in trouble. So then we said, well, what if we individualize this? We're not gonna predict the whole clinic. We're gonna look at every individual person. And let's see what we can learn about every single person and from the electronic health record. What if we look at where they live and how old they are and whether they're missing other appointments and if they have mood or anxiety disorders or conduct disorders? We have all of that in our electronic health record. So we created a regression equation. And in this case, the, the perishable commodity is not the whole clinic, just like the perishable commodity is not the whole airplane. The clinic is going to be open for business. The perishable commodity is the procedure. So just like a seat map for an airplane, this is our map for the, for the clinic. And we're not going to predict if all these people are going to show. We're going to look at, at we're going to look at Mr. or Mrs. Becker. What do we know about her? We know a lot about her. In fact, we know enough to figure out if she's going to show up or not, with some error term at the end. 
But it turns out, when we look at this from a receiver operating characteristic curve point of view, we can predict who's going to show up and who's not going to show up with 85% accuracy. We did this at the VA hospital, where we then got a grant, which we just finished, or are finishing now, where we actually prospectively were able to figure out who was going to show up and who's not going to show up. And we actually did it. And what you're looking at here are uh, the results. Uh, this is actually in press right now in the American Journal of Managed Care, where we used big data algorithms to predict who's going to show up and who's not going to show up. And you see a few different approaches. This, this dotted line here at the top is um, when you overshoot. If you go over that dot, the dotted line, we overbooked. And this is the red zone. We got to stay out of the red zone. So if we were to overbook by a fixed amount, we would be in the red zone a lot. If we didn't overbook, it turned out that people weren't showing up. But when we uh, overbooked using big data algorithms, we floated just underneath that line and maximized throughput, maximized revenue. And we're able to actually to help move our VA from something like the 10th percentile in the country to somewhere around the 80th percentile in the country for endoscopy throughput. There are a lot of other things that contributed to that, but one of them was this study. A couple times we did bounce into the red zone, but guess what? We got through the day. We guaranteed no one was able to get, uh, no one was able, and we're going to send nobody home. The deal was as the PI, I had to come in and scope the patient. That was the deal that we made. So, I, yeah, that's how we did it. All right, so um, what are the lessons? Now I'm just about done. First, we have to select the right unit of analysis, the most granular unit you can find. Use all the data that you have at your disposal. We used all the data on every patient, N equals all. Use all data types that you can get your hands on that, that might or may not even be predictive. You may find some things that make no sense predict. And we're so used to things having to make sense, computers don't care if it makes sense or not. As long as they can predict, that's what matters in this world. Continuously and rapidly improve it. We, we kept tweaking our weights and tweaking our, our, uh, our regression model to try to keep up with this. So this is uh, what I would ask you to sort of think about. We make all sorts of mistakes. Our intuition is sometimes wrong, and we also can't predict as well as we think we can. Data can help, but garbage in, garbage out. We need humans, we need people constantly thinking about the data and making sense of the data so we can spin it into knowledge and wisdom. Data and information are not the same. People matter the most. And if we're going to find the next John Schick, if we're going to predict traffic, if we're going to predict domestic violence, or if we're going to address no-shows, we're going to need volumes, variety, and velocity of data applied to the most granular unit that we possibly can. And that's what I have for you today. So thanks for showing up and sticking around. All right.